Hello, all. We are going to start first with an um, acknowledgement of country. Um, and we acknowledge the first Australians on whose traditional lands the University of Sydney stands, the Gadigal of the Euro Nation, and pay our respects to the elders, past and present. They have never said sovereignty and remain strong in their enduring connection to land, sea, community, and culture. And today is a pleasure to continue a huge house lecture series that started last night with uh, Atelier Seder Keller joining us from Zurich. Um, and today we have the pleasure to work, virtually welcome um, Soren Thirup Filman uh, from Filman Architects in Copenhagen. No? Um, an office uh, founded in 2021 by Soren himself that you can see on the screen. And it is established uh, upon the foundation of Lenzo and Filman which Soren funded together with Kim Lenzo after graduated at the Royal Academy in, in Denmark in Copenhagen in 2014. Uh, and this, this uh, and probably you have seen around some of his recent projects or at least his renders because the, the students have been checking some of them obviously from our factory lab on now the head of a project that Soren uh, recently won uh, not too far from the student village that we're gonna check today also in Arus where I think he's from. You know? Um, and his architecture is defined by two of the uh, outermost positions of architectural scale, context and component, or so he says. Uh, the projects aim to state the material itself as the protagonist by exploring the immunity processes and potentials of materials, they create a robust and simple architecture, ranging from temporary pavilions and single family house to transformations of huge houses and cultural institutions. Please join me in welcoming Soren Thirofelman. Thank you, Soren. Thank you very much, Juliana, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I was actually I have, um, prepared a small introduction myself, but I think I'll just skip that part now. Um, but to all you students that are out there, I um, we just had a, a short talk before you uh, came online and uh, decided that if you have any questions during my presentation, please just raise your hand or. Uh, write something in the text field, and I think Guillermo will bring it forward as, uh, as fast as possible. But um, I'll just uh, start to share my screen. Uh, hang on. Can you see my screen now? Yes, perfect. It's okay. working well. Perfect. Okay, but um, yeah, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to talk about um, the projects we've been doing and the things that we are working on right now. It's always, I think it's always uh, interesting also from my perspective to, to, uh, to have time to talk about what we are doing and also we're just reflecting about what our method is. And I think I will, I will be doing that a bit today as well. So um, the first <clears throat> the first pictures I have uh, I've, I've, I've brought with me here they have been taken by uh, a Danish architectural photographer Hamburg Bernsen, and he's a guy that we always use to document our products or like our projects um, with. And I'm also having the privilege to share my studio together with this guy. And last year, me and uh, Hamburg we went on a small study trip together with uh, another. Danish curator, Marianne Cole. She was the curator of the Danish contribution for the Architecture Biennale uh, last year in Venice. And we, we are going on this study trip together um, to di different Danish production facilities um, because we share this uh, mutual interest of how things are being brought to life uh, of, for different reasons. But I think what, what really drives us and why we, we go on this study trip together is because that we, we think um, that genuine architectural quality always takes its starting point in how uh, the components that we use or the materials that we use are being processed and how we use our resources. And especially when, it's able, when the, the architecture is capable of telling these stories in the final result, so that when you experience architecture, you have like an understanding of how things are being put together and what, um, what the, like, the basic uh, material uh, and the basic components it's made of, uh, how they are being processed in the first hand. So last, uh, I think it was also last year, um, 
a Danish, uh, a Danish foundation called uh, Gunnarsson's Foundation, they asked us if we could um, come up with a brief for uh, an architectural competition for students. And I thought this was, uh, this was interesting, um, also because uh, it's always nice when you do a competition brief for students because you can focus on a particular thing that you find very interesting in the, uh, the field of architecture. So we came up with a very simple spatial program, but what we encouraged the students to do were to only use organic materials, but they should use organic materials that was been processed in the industry. And I, know, I don't know how it works uh, in Australia, but here in Denmark, there is a tendency that as soon as we start to talk about organic materials, the only thing people can mention is wood. And I, like that is like there's a lack of understanding or a lack of language to talk about these different hybrid products of very processed organic materials. So we were encouraging the students to find new ways of how we could use either residual products uh, from other production facilities or how we could use wood chips or hempcrete or all these uh, other constellations of where you are uh, bringing organic material to, uh, together in an industrial way uh, that could maybe um, uh, solve some of the bigger issues that we are all facing in the building industry when we have to bring down our carbon emissions. And I really think this, this way of trying to take a couple of steps backwards um, to figuring out what lies before the final product um, is something that we are very interested in. So when this uh, curator of Denmark that I mentioned earlier, Maya Nicole, when she asked us as part of her contribution to the, the Venice Biennale last year um, to come in with a, a contribution for a book that she did as a part of this exhibition, she asked us if we could uh, reflect a bit of, um, on the word home. So she was doing this, um, this, uh, this book of a lot of different themes where she was asking or a lot of different people from scientists to artists, architects, and so on, uh, to reflect on different topics. And she, she was asking us if we could reflect on the, on the theme home. And I think to, to me and to most people, home is something very unique. Um, it's something that we often identify, identify ourselves with. Um, but what we decided to do here was to have a critical look on our own projects. And even though that we are, we are an office that always try to expose the materials that we are using in our, um, in our projects, it's very difficult due to a lot of different reasons, but especially due to regulations and the way that we built um, today. So by having a critical look at our own projects, we decided to build these one to six scale models. And then instead of calling the contribution home, we called it home minus 12 and a half mil, which is the average thickness of a traditional gypsum board. So then we were removing like this outer layer of all of our uh, pro uh, projects. And what you get to see when you do this is that everything that is just behind the surface um, it's not unique in any way. Uh, it's actually very generic. And I, I would uh, dare to say that it's the same materials that you use in Australia as the ones we use here in Denmark. It's materials from these big players in the building industry, such as Sankobang or Knau for a lot of the others. And I think for, for architects working in the praxis, it's, it's not, there's nothing new to this because we know that's how, that's how we build today. But I think for a lot of other people, that are outside the field of architecture, outside the field of the building industry, they, they don't understand this. They don't know that when they are asking for a wooden house, it's actually just a wood cladding on a lot of other different materials inside of it. So they, it's just, we're just building the environment on top of uh, how we're actually building. And then we're hiding away the materials that construct uh, our, um, our houses today. And <clears throat> this of course was a critical look and actually the picture to the right here is from the student house project uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, later. But, th this, but this critical look on, on our own project has also turned into a kind of a method of how we work now. Um, it's been that for quite a long time, but it's just being more and more clear uh, the way that we approach uh, our projects. 
So just a couple of pictures from a small project we did last year for a small art institution in Copenhagen um, called Art Hub Copenhagen. They moved into this uh, very generic office space in uh, the meatpacking district of Copenhagen. So it used to be a place where they were producing meat or part of the meat industry. And then over the years, it dates back to, I think, 1930s. But then over the years, the, this whole area has been transformed into a lot of bars, restaurants, but also a lot of uh, these generic office spaces. So what you see in this, uh, these pictures, like very traditional office spaces in Denmark, you have the suspended ceilings, uh, these gypsum boards, uh, gypsum tiles. You have the, the glass partitions for the meeting spaces. You have this uh, look-alike uh, concrete floor. It's just something very like a, a thin film that is being uh, poured over, I think, a wooden floor to make it look more uh, industrial. And, and so we thought that this was an interesting uh, starting point because you see these spaces so many places. And what you normally do is like that you just tear it all down and just start all over. But in this particular case, then the institution were only going to be here for a short period of time, a couple of years, actually before they're going to move into another project that we are doing right now, which was the one Gilamo uh, mentioned at the very beginning, the one that we won uh, in this old um, industrial building in the northwestern part of Copenhagen. But until that, <laughs> that project will be done, they have to be in this uh, particular place. So we, we decided instead of Instead of coming up with a concept and then tear it all down and, um, and then they had to do it all over again in a couple of years when another uh, render is going to move in, then we decided to go down there and disassemble everything in order to create a library or an archive of all the existing materials. And then by doing this, our intentions were to bring as few new materials into this space as possible. So just rearrange what was already there and do it in a way so that you'll be able to bring it back into its original state if that would be necessary. Uh, so the pictures to the left here, it's uh, me and some other people from the office uh, down there trying to disassemble the, the ceiling. And then you can see some parts of this archive we are creating in the back. And then as we go, as we disassemble each element down there, we also we brought forward a concept for the place. So what they wanted to do were that instead of, of course, they wanted to give the, the space another atmosphere. They wanted to have a more, um, a more interesting uh, sp spatial experience when people come to visit this art, this art institution. But they also wanted it to be a place where they could have everything from informal meetings to exhibitions and like just a big flexible space that could be used in many different ways. So what we, we brought to this place was some simple aluminum rails and then some key handles that we could connect these uh, gypsum boards that we are taking down with. So the picture to the left here is just before we uh, went into this room and the picture to the right, it's after the transformation. So what you see is that everything that was already in the room has just been reused. We have just insisted on finding both technical but also aesthetic quality in things that uh, we normally wouldn't find very interesting. Uh, and it's very, very few elements that we have actually added to the space. And I think this is, <clears throat> this is something that, that really defines us right now. I think, and I also think that the way architecture in general should, uh, the way it should go should be more about finding quality in what already exists instead of always coming forward with a new idea and new materials, um, but trying to see how we can, we can use what we, what's already there, uh, but in different con configurations in order to meet the demands that we have. And from that, we are jumping directly over to the, to the project I was asked to talk about, uh, the Student Village Project. Um, and to those of you that don't know the project, it's a, it's a student housing project. Um, it's situated just outside of Aarhus, uh, the next biggest city of Denmark. Uh, and it's, there's about 70 students living there right now. And uh, the whole project uh, took its starting point in this farm that you see to the left. Um, it's an old farm, uh, a full timbered farm back from 
Actually, it's very, very old. It's back from 1670s. Um, and these are images from, I think, around 1940s when it was still functioning as a traditional farm. And when we, when we first came there back in 2014, this, uh, this farm was in very terrible condition. There was a lot of holes in the roof. And as you know, when you have a wooden structure and there's a lot of water pouring in, it's not good for anything of it. Uh, some of the walls were falling down, um, dissolved. A lot of the timber was rotten. But even though that it was in this condition, uh, we immediately saw the potential this farm had of bringing it back to its, um, its original state. So we, the, the first thing we did was uh, to do very, very precise measurements of the existing farm. And then as we do the, did the measurements, we also did a lot of analysis work so that we could see which part of the timber was able to keep, which part did we have to renovate, where do we have to bring new materials in in order to bring the, the farm back. So this was a very um, like a hands-on analysis on site, a bit similar to the one in the art hub, um, in the art hub project, where we were just walking around, uh, figuring out which part of this farm could be reused and which which can't. But then at the same time, as we did this hands-on analysis, we also went into the local archive just to see how, like, what kind of context did this farm used to be part of. And I don't know if you see my cursor uh, right now, but you see to the image here in the left, you have this small village. It's, this is an aerial photo from also, I think, 1940s, 1950s. And you have this small village here, uh, almost in the middle of, uh, of the image. And then you have another small uh, city, Vibu, it also says that on the map. And then further out to the right, you have uh, Aarhus. And then over the years, what happened was that the neighboring city of Aarhus, of course, expanded very rapidly, uh, and especially all the suburban areas. So this small village, the village which is called Norby, meaning something, uh, meaning north village or north city uh, in Danish, and uh, the farm was called uh, Søgård, meaning uh, lake farm. Um, but as the, the neighboring city of Aarhus expanded, the small village of Norby just increased and not increased, it, uh, it shrunk down, like the small farms that was part of this village, they disappeared. So when we, when we came there in 2014, the only part that was left from this village was actually the farm that I showed you images of earlier. And what we found that was very interesting about this particular village that the farm was uh, used to be part of was that when we go back to I think 1860 in Denmark, there was a reformation in the agricultural land of Denmark. So before that, most of, uh, most of the farms were either scattered around uh, in, this, uh, in the landscape or some of them were in clusters as the one you see to the right here. But all the pieces of land that each farm owner had was scattered around in the surrounding landscape. So in order to go out to do the farming, you had to transport yourself out to a lot of different uh, small pieces of fields to do the harvesting. And then after the Reformation back in 1860s, they decided to, uh, in order to make the, 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 um, the farming more efficient, they decided to collect all these small pieces of land into one piece for each farm owner so that the farming would be more efficient. But the, all the farm owners, they still, they like to be part of these small villages because that was where they had all their social life. And so these star-shaped cities start to emerge in Denmark, where you can see as the one to the right here, you have all the small roads pointing in towards the village so that you have like a small, like not a small, but a, a piece of land formed like this wedge. And the wedge points in to where the landowner is, uh, is situated. So when you have a farm that, that, uh, that's part of the village, then on one side, uh, when you go out of your farm, you are participating in this small village life and you have all, have all your neighbors. But as soon as you go out on the other side of the farm, you have direct contact to the surrounding landscape and to your own, uh, own field. And we thought this was a very um, interesting way of uh, arranging a village uh, especially in our in our situation where we had to come up with a come up with an idea for a student village, so we thought we could maybe use this uh, in 
to, to create a layout where we kind of um, did a reinterpretation of the old Norby, the old village that was originally city, uh, situated there, but then used the same qualities as this old village had in order to create a great community for students. So we came up with this layout where the old farm is the three wings that you see here in the middle. And then after we did all these analysis and um, uh, we were doing all the dimensions of the existing farm, then we came up with new wings and new small farms that we just surrounded uh, the old farm with. And by doing so, then we created all these small, uh, all these small uh, streets or roads um, that are very, very dense, where we are ensuring that all the students are going to meet each other on a daily basis. And then on the other side of uh, all the new wings, there you're going to have either like a, a look towards an open landscape, a horse riding field, or a dense forest. Um, and this is a picture that was taken last year as part of a, um, a book release. So I think it was this is a, it has really been a, a project. Um, where we both approached uh, the whole concept from a very overall uh, point of view, trying to figure out what has the historical con uh, context been and how could we benefit from that and how could we use some of the historical qualities from this particular site to create value for the students that are gonna live there in the future. And then at the same time, it has been a lot about being on site, uh, peeling down all these weird layers that has been added or added to the building for the last uh, 300 or 400 years. And then when doing so, figuring out if any of these materials or any of these layers that we find on our way, if they could be reused in the final result. So by, by peeling all these uh, old transformations down, there is something that we find that dates back to its, um, when it was originally built back in the 1600s, but there's also parts from the 1700s, something for the 1890s and so on. So just to give you an example, these uh, baby blue tiles that we found here in, in the old barn, we just washed them off and then they became part of like the final result. So, so the image here to the right is actually inside from one, uh, one of the student houses that have been, um, that has been made in the old barn where they used to have cattle. And so I think the, the whole project really uh, circles around this uh, juxtaposition about uh, showing the new part next to the old one but doing it in a way where we try to highlight all the qualities and, and especially trying to highlight uh, the areas where the new and the old uh, are going in dialogue with each other instead of trying to contrast the two things against each other. And, and this is, um, again, this is one of the, one of the student use units in the old barn where you, you can see that there is some of the some of the, the things that you see at for instance the, the brick wall on the back and the old timber is uh, is some of the old wall like the bricks are new but the timber is uh, original all the new timber that you see in the image has been added on uh, later and this white um, interior walls that you find in the base um, is also to meet modern regulations so that we can insulate the farm from the inside so that we don't gonna instro uh, destroy the the look of the, of the farm from the outside, but every time that we have this, uh, these existing uh, windows in the, in the walls, then we're just gonna pause like, or stop the whole insulation part. And then we introduce this, these bigger windows so that we are both framing the original windows, but we also frame the, the timber frames from the inside. And then to the new wings, this is a, there is mostly two uh, different, uh, housing units in the new wings. And this is one of the ones that they're most of. And it's very basic, uh, it's basic layout and it's also very dense. So you enter the building from the streets of the village where you have this small entrance. Then you have a bath and the toilet on the right. And then you go directly into your kitchen or living room, like the single space where you also have a view towards the surrounding landscape. And then from there, you have this uh, ladder that brings you to the first floor where you have your, um, your, your sleeping room, um, so to say. And the way it's been constructed is that 
because there is so much glass in the one side, it's very difficult to keep stability in this uh, in this housing type. So that this unit with the bath and the toilet, it's actually it's a steel unit that been um, that has been done as a prefab unit and then been hoisted on place and casted directly into the foundation of the of the new construction. And so the toilets are actually this, the the stabilizing elements in the construction in these new wings. And this is an image we took right after we handed the project over to the client back in 2016, I think. And then I just stumbled upon this image that was taken last year that I just find very uh, amazing because even though that we all, you know, cherish that that people should inhabit our space, then there also, I also think there is a tendency towards that we always as architects um, love these empty spaces where you really see the architecture. But this just, I think this is a good, rem um, it reminds me of how spaces really should be inhabited. Uh, and it's, uh, it's just lovely to see. Yeah, and this is some of the drawings that we did. Um, we did when we have done the, the final analysis of the place. And so, <clears throat> The image here is, I think that that is one of the most important places um, of this project. And it's also a place that you'll find yourself in uh, many, many areas, like many times when you walk around in this uh, village, because you constantly find yourself in this in-between area between the old farm on one side and then the new wings of the new farms on the other side. And again, what's like the, the idea with this meeting is that they should, on one hand, they should try to be honest about that one part is being built back in 1670s, uh, 60, 1670s, and the other part is being built in the 2000s. But at the same time, we are trying to, to find ways of highlighting some of the motives that are characterizing and very important for the old farm, but figuring out ways that they can be introduced in a new way of building where they're not just being introduced as uh, motives in order to create a copy or like a nostalgic uh, look back to how you could have been built, like how you would be, how you would build in the past, but more trying to figure out if there is any ways of introducing these motives in a way where it actually makes sense, not just aesthetically, but also technically in, in a modern way of building. And you see that, for instance, with the rhythm in the facade, where you have all the wooden timber in the, in the old farm, uh, which I think is very characterizing for this uh, building type. And so we have we have come up with these over-dimensioned um, wooden uh, boards that lead you into each of these new student uh, units. So when you walk around in the in the streets, as the one that you see here, you are constantly seeing this. Uh, mirroring in the street where you have the rhythm that, that, that is being mirrored on both uh, sides, both in the new and the old. You also see the, the high-pitched roof without the gutters. You see uh, like the wooden beams that are binding the old facades together so they are not falling apart and being met by these new lamps that have been mounted on the wooden cladding. You have the recessed uh, foundation on the new ones in order to keep your wood the wood away from the soil. And in the same way, they had these big stones uh, just for the same reason, so that the lower part of the wooden timber frame was kept away from, uh, from the soil. You also see like this small line that you find in the, in the ground next to the old farm uh, due to all the rain when it's pouring down and there is no gutters. It, it kind of like creates this line in the landscape and we're trying to do it ourselves in the other side. So we have cast this concrete slab and then the rain is pouring down just after the concrete slab and creating the same type of line but then the concrete slab is also um, like an in-between zone before you enter your um, your your student uh, unit so that you have a place to put your, your shoes or your bike and so on and so when walking around this in these kind of um, um, like spaces then you'll also meet all your neighbors but then as soon as you enter your, um, your, your student unit, then you'll have a look towards this uh, surrounding landscape, which is something completely different. 
Now, like the image to the right is very romantic as it's uh, when it was taken here back in 2017. But what happened afterwards was our neighbors built a big fence in this area. So it's not that romantic anymore. Now people are just looking into a fence. But hopefully he will he will take that down uh, uh, again sometime. We're, we're staying in a dialogue with him. But the whole the whole idea with this that is that you can really you can participate in the social life on one side of the uh, of your village like of your house and then on the other side you are having a more intimate area where you can meet just you can be alone in your own student unit or you can meet like just your neighbor or sit there with a small group of friends and then of course we are keeping the original courtyard of the old farm um, so that you have this one space that is very generic and uh, not generic but uh, generous in size where you could keep uh, and host a lot of social events. Um, so this is also like the main, of course, the main courtyard of the old farm, but it's also like the main plaza now of the whole village. It's also centered, like when you, when, if you can remember the plan I showed you earlier, this is like the most centered part in uh, the village. And then the, the old barn that you see here in the very end of the village, or the, the picture, sorry, that has been transformed into a, a, like a shared space. So in this old barn, um, you will find laundry, laundry facilities, you'll have the technical facilities to, to the rest of the existing farm. And then you just have this big generic space where people could have Friday bars, they can host different social events. And then we have also trying to, um, to see how can we, not just be inspired by the existing farm when we had to come up with a layout for the new wings, but also see the other way around. If, there were, if it was possible to take some of the materials and the qualities that were being introduced in the new wings and see how they could be introduced in the old farm. And there is, as I mentioned earlier, for instance, this insulation part that you see created out of these gypsum walls. You also have uh, in the picture here, um, the, the high pitched roof with the existing old wooden structure. But then on the all, outside of that, we have um, mounted these uh, fiber gypsum boards and uh, created a new roof. As you also see, it's the image to the, to the right, which is insulated again, so that we can keep uh, um, a normal temperature inside. And also in a way for the new wings and the old farm to to, to be in another kind of dialogue. Instead of if you only had the, the roof type that you see to the left in the image to the, uh, to the right here, then there will, I think there would be a too big a difference between the old and the new. So it's really about trying to, um, to intertween and like merge together the new, the old and the old, the new uh, in order to, it to, um, to work together. Thank you very much. That was my presentation, and now I'm very open for questions. Thank you, Soren. Fantastic, um, great building, of course. Um, so, um, unless anybody wants um, any any answer, any question, uh, we are going to keep with the format of the talk, and I will have a, a short response, Soren, to to your presentation, even most of it has already been said, but it maybe triggers a, a couple of, of more discussions between us or, or with the audience as well, whatever. Yeah. Student housing needs to find its place in Vivi, near ours. Its the scale is not different from the scale of the surrounding contest. Yes, it is actually very different. 11 bands or a combination of seven L shape and singular construction, depending on how you prefer to look at them create this archaic village next to the highway, generic office and housing blocks and some other suburban houses. We could say the student housing finds its nostalgic scale by looking at the existing barn on the side, but of course, with a contemporary attitude, playing around a little bit. Stepping from the units onto the street, following the street into the courtyard or heading into the forest, the rooms have a back and a front and offer views and privacy. The voluminous rooms come together as different and at the same time similar pitch roof buildings tied together 
by construction and materiality. The old buildings are refurbished to then assemble new ones. New big thin roofs, timber structures, aluminum and pine windows, questionable furniture and fancy curtains put together with all layers visible. Raw and cozy, old and new, and tweak yet contemporary. Walking outside, you see the student housing complex different winds, extending outwards, spreading itself into arrows, but in a restrained manner. It's almost two stories, keep it in a scale. In between the buildings, streets, courtyards, and alleys connect individual rooms, relating them to one another. Yet, the in between mostly relates to the rooms, to the students, and to the surrounding landscape. The building, the rooms, and the materials as a collection give a scale to the student life that will take place both inside and outside. In this condition, it is clear that this cluster of materials and buildings becomes a layer huge house. Thank you, Soren. Thank you very much. Um, the idea that this, um, that maybe I read a little bit too fast, but the idea that it can trigger a, a response from you or some discussion around it. Sorry, can you repeat that again? That, that the idea is that that little uh, reflection um, triggers a, an answer or a, or a, or a, a, a debate uh, within this, uh, with the difficulties of Zoom also, I'm, I'm being here, but um, yeah. I don't know. No, but I, I think it was, uh, it was interesting <laughs> just to hear what you said, uh, Guillermo, and I really think uh, when you talked about the context, uh, like with the highways and the blocks, and because I didn't mention that in the presentation, but that is, uh, that is completely true. And I also think that is, uh, I think that's just a, a, an important thing to point out that that's actually the reason why we, we are looking into the historical archives, because to me, context can be many things, because if you have an area as you are having here, where there is, uh, in my opinion, uh, a lack of good um, urban uh, spaces or ways of people, like uh, architectural uh, outdoor space that brings people together, then we have to look elsewhere instead of just reproducing what was already there. And I think that, is, that can sometimes be the problem about talking about too much of context, because context is not always a good thing. So uh, in this particular case, we're trying to bring back a context that actually had qualities to this particular place. And then uh, hopefully that could ignite a transformation of this whole space. So that when suddenly there is this small village um, and some of the neighboring, because there is also actually one neighboring farm it's just being built way later, that instead of trying to build a fence around the farm and not participating in the, the social life that's going on, then hopefully over some time, uh, people would start to embrace this instead of, and just uh, build on top of the building, like the village plan that we already did, so that this could be a village that are actually uh, increasing instead of shrinking down when uh, always is expanding. Very nice to hear that the, the, the village is spreading, even probably not with your buildings. But I think one thing that the, the series tries is how a singular project, and yesterday was very clear with the Seder Keller, can have also urban ambitions. And, and I think both of them are, are very clear, completely different. Both of them are a little bit archaic, um, and both of them understanding context uh, differently. You very broadly, as you say, know, almost the, the historical context that, that made this, made this place. But I think both of them are. are um, optimistic by criticizing also the, the, the existing context of, of the area. Um, mm. No, um, um, does anybody want anything? If not, um, we like keeping the, the talks uh, short and sharp, sorry, and I think you give a, a very thorough um, explanation of, of the student housing and how um, they can be uh, built uh, and also a very important attention to all scales, once again, something that is very important in our generation from the how you build these things, how, how you look at these things and how they can have a, a, an impact at the scale of the city. Obviously being, um, being not too naive about thinking that this is gonna change the outcomes of Arus, but it, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna it trigger a conversation maybe when the neighbors are gonna keep building around um, and we'll see. So Soren, I think um, with that, we let you maybe enjoy 
of a beautiful day in Copenhagen, as you say, because it's, it's, it's May, no, and it's the spring, and we hope everybody is playing in the streets of the, the student housing. They have the windows open, and and the community life is is flourishing over there. Yeah, yeah, and I just want to say here at the the end that if any of you someday should visit Denmark, just please reach out, and I will go out and show you. Or you can also just go to the student village yourself. the The open barn is the one you see here in the, in the image. It's always open, so you can just you can just go into the village, bump in there, and hopefully there will be some young people having a beer too. Um, so that's I think that's the best way to experience it. We will take your words, Soren, and we will visit uh, to see how the rooms are, are being used because I think that's the, the, the frame is there and let's see how they are used and, and maybe uh, we, we have a drink in, over this barn. Uh, <laughs> fantastic, Soren. Uh, thank you very much and thanks everybody for attending to today's lecture. Please join us tomorrow instead of 6.30 at 5.30 uh, for David Scon's lecture uh, tomorrow. Soren, you are also welcome to join us any of the days for on Thursday with David Cohn or Friday with Tom Emerson from 6A Architects to keep discussing student housing as the ultimate typology to discuss contemporary life. Thank you very much to everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Oren. Bye. Very nice to meet you.